Hello, welcome to Avaaz the Voice. Today we have a distinguished guest with us, Tripur Daman Singh. He is a postdoctoral fellow at University of London, and he has written two books on Nehru. One is about his correspondence with Jinnah, uh, uh, Allama Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, the poet, the famous poet. Uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee and uh, Sardar Patel and another one 16 stormy days is a story of the first amendment constitutional amendment in India uh, which made news quite a lot uh, lately for last two years uh, so first I want to welcome uh, Mr. Tripur Daman Singh. Thank you very much for inviting me it's a great pleasure. Yeah so first of all to start with uh, for us uh, why you chose to write about the First Amendment, the story of First, first Amendment, Amendment, the story of those 16 stormy days. So what was the inspiration? Why you write about it? And what what's, what is so stormy about 16 days? So um, I started working on it because I'd always been interested uh, in constitutional history um, to a point. And I'd been uh, on a... Out of interest, I was reading about um, the freedom of speech and about zamindari abolition. And the deeper I went on, uh, you know, the deeper I went into this subject, the more I realized uh, just how important this First Amendment had been and how little um, literature there was on it. So there wasn't much. There was only, I came across maybe two, uh, two papers um, that I found useful and interesting. And so I decided, to, you know, this was going to be a subject that I was going to explore. And it's something that's not just, uh, it's important beyond appearances. And that sort of drove me to, uh, to really, really dig deep into it. Tell us about the First Amendment, why it is so important. What was in it? What was the content? Uh so um, there were three main prongs. Um, the right, um, in a sense, uh, partial curtailment of the right to freedom of speech, uh, more or less very dramatic curtailment of the right to property, and um, quite a curtailment of the right to freedom from discrimination. So the Nehru government had been facing um, setbacks in, um, in the court as soon as the uh, constitution had come into force on 26 January 1950. So the first judgment started coming in uh, within you know, a few days by, uh, I think, the case of the communist um, uh, prisoners, um, which I start the book with, was 1st or 2nd February 1950. So the government started facing a number of uh, setbacks pretty quickly. And uh, there were three, three sort of big ones. The first one was on... Uh, they had uh, had a pre-censorship order against the organizer, which was the mouthpiece of the RSS, um, and, and an order banning Crossroads, which was a communist-leaning weekly. And both those outlets had been extremely critical of the Nehru government um, for a variety of reasons, organizer over what was happening in Bengal, the communal situation in Bengal and writing in East Pakistan, and uh, the um, crossroads about um, with regard to what was happening in Telangana and in Salem, where uh, communist prisoners were being treated incredibly badly, and there had been a particularly gruesome incident in um, Salem jail, Salem. Uh, where the police had shot, uh, locked about 200 people into a hall and shot at them point blank. So facing um, such stark criticism, the government had responded by these orders, uh, censorship or banning. And both these orders were overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, and the relevant sections of the Public Safety Acts were declared unconstitutional. So um, if we, uh, in a sense, the government's legal armory uh, took a huge battering with, uh, with this order. Secondly, there was the question of zamindari abolition because the Bihar Zamindari Abolition Act had been declared unconstitutional by the Patna High Court. And again, this had happened uh, not, interestingly, not due to the right to property, but due to the right to equality because the rates at which compensation, were, uh, compensation was being paid were different depending on how much land you owned, which was unacceptable to, um, to the court. And the third prong was uh, reservations uh, because what was then the Madras province had had a long-running policy of, uh, of affirmative action, of reservations, 
uh, and this had been enforced since the 1920s in one form or another. But given that the constitution guaranteed freedom from discrimination, uh, this system of reservations, it was a rather peculiar system of reservations because it's prescribed uh, a very fixed ratio in which um, seats were to be allocated in educational institutions and in um, government employment. Uh, this was again found to be unconstitutional and against um, uh, on the anvil of um, the right to freedom from discrimination, and so on all three uh, on all three questions, the government found itself on the back foot, unable to clamp down on critics, uh, facing delays in zamindari abolition, which had been a key plank of the Congress program. Uh, and facing an existential, very existential question on the policy of reservations. Reservations not to schedule castes and schedule tribes, uh, but policy of reservations beyond that. And so uh, Nehru's attitude to, to the question was, well, you know, we've promised all of this. We can't now go back to the people and say, we can't do it because the constitution stands in our way. So the uh, the only outcome that he saw was to change the constitution yeah your book uh, though the title is those stormy 16 days yes the, yes uh, 16 stormy days but it looks like that it is about an event but it's talk about continuity it, yes uh, it talks about continuity from the colonial to post-colonial and to the present yeah. uh, and you have especially talked about the sedition law yes. somewhere that how yes. sedition law was uh, Nehru also felt at some point of time after those 16 months he felt that it is needed and how it is still being used mm -hmm. through throughout the successive governments for last 75 years or 70 years yes it is being used uh, by the state against mm -hmm. the people and before that also so how do you look that this continuity why the government thought that it is so important for them that such laws and uh, the curtailment of fundamental rights. Uh, what was exactly the problem with the constitution, the original constitution, how it guaranteed fundamental right and how it was changed during the first amendment right. and how and what are its implications on our present? So, again, I mean, the question before them was, uh, some like Sardar Patel felt that uh, many of these rights were an outcome of irrational exuberance um, during the process of um, you know, writing up the constitution or the process of drafting. For the government, um, the question was that they wanted these laws in the legal armory. Uh, that was you know, the first consideration. Whether they used them or didn't use them was you know, a question to be decided on later. As Nehru keeps saying, uh, you should trust parliament with these powers. The second was, of course, there was many of these leaders had lived through quite a turbulent period uh, with partition and the associated violence. And so there was a feeling that these sorts of extraordinary situations might, might recur. Uh, and to uh, deal with any sort of recurrence of uh, an extraordinary situation like partition or uh, at that point, there was a you know raging rebellion in Telangana. There were ongoing questions about the Northeast. Uh, you you know you needed these kinds of quite draconian um, legal tools, and so uh, you know they they, they felt that uh, these were the tools that were necessary. And as far as uh, Nehru went, Nehru's idea right from the outset, if you you know read the very early debates of the Constituent Assembly uh, or when Nehru um, you know, presents the objectives resolution, he repeatedly makes the point that this is a constitution to uh, you know, feed the starving millions and clothe the naked people and so on and so forth. So for him, it was the means to an end and an end that he saw as you know, um, whether one can term it socialism, whether one can term it, uh, you know, one can term it whatever they want. But for him, there was this end. Uh, there was um, a pathway towards that end. That pathway was embodied in the Congress Party's program. Uh, and the Congress Party, or at least the legislature, represented the wishes of the people. And the wishes of the people then had to prevail. So it was a very expansive vision of parliamentary sovereignty uh, that he was presenting. And in his, uh, you know, in his view, actually, 
the legislature and given the dominance of the Congress Party and the executive within the Congress Party, in some ways the executive was uh, was dominant. There was no question of equality between the three you know, organs of state as we, um, as we call them. You've just talked about Sardar Patel uh, and you have written about it that uh, it is one of those rare occasions during 1947, 48, 49 and 50 when uh, Nehru and Patel were on the same page, were they? Yeah. I don't think they were on the same page. Uh, they were on the same page when it came to the question of uh, freedom of speech. Yeah, and it came right. the question of uh, of um, you know the press and things. And I think there they were. There was uh, it represented a sort of rare consensus. And you mentioned continuity in your previous question. Uh, this was again a more or less a kind of continuity from uh, from the colonial period because. The ultimate belief was that uh, you know society had to be guided and controlled by uh, a kind of superior intelligence in the state, and so you know that couldn't be done without having access to these quite draconian legal tools. Legal tools. And so you know, Patel called it irrational exuberance. Uh, Nehru, in later criticism, says we can't have. Uh, uh, you know, we can't tolerate a situation where, you know, we're being criticized or we're being bu- bullied by uh, public opinion. So, you know, there is, they're coming to it from slightly different angles, but they're meeting at uh, at the same place. So whether the, the reasons that they want it are divergent, but they both want it for one reason or another. One reason yeah. or another. Uh, and also you have talked about it in your book also that somewhere Nehru was putting his manifesto over the constitution yes. uh, constitution or constitutionality as we say and uh, he was uh, he, you quoted a few mm-hmm. people that he was quite a dictator at this uh, that he wanted his whole congress plan to you know supersede something like constitution mm-hmm. so uh, please uh, tell us about that, how it was, and uh, why I, it was so needed. Well, I wouldn't call him a dictator. There are others who did. Yeah, uh, yeah. you and, quoted a few yeah, people. Yeah, I, I quoted several people, and there was, uh, including uh, his one of his critics, the socialist politician Jay Prakash Narayan. Jay Prakash Narayan. Uh, and um, at some point, even John Mathai, his former cabinet colleague, yeah. accuses him of having these sorts of authoritarian tendencies. So, but I wouldn't call him a dictator because one thing that Nehru does is he doesn't short circuit process. So, uh, you know, cabinet meetings are held. Everything goes through the cabinet. It goes through uh, a committee may stage. May I just intervene into sure. it? Uh, you just said he didn't short circuit the process. But you have also talked about that how ordinances were used yes. uh, time and again. And people have objected. People yes, have objected. the speaker has objected. Uh, speaker, yes. Mavlankar has Mavlankar objected. Has objected. So, uh, how uh, then? Why are you saying that he wasn't short circuiting this uh, whole process? No, but process? the thing is, the constitution gave him those legal tools. Now, it's I do not agree that the constitution should give a legal tool such as an ordinance uh, to a government. India is the only country, uh, one of the only countries in the modern world, where the executive has the power to legislate, right? Through ordinance, an executive, a, a government can create a law without calling uh, parliament into session. Uh, this is a kind of power that no, uh, in most modern democracies, this power doesn't exist without a declaration of emergency and so on and so forth. So, in on, on a, I'm making a very technical point when I say that he's not short-circuiting uh, process. I do say that he's short-circuiting, uh, he's not unaware of, but he is um, bending constitutional morality to suit present day exig- exigencies. So I do say that. And I do agree with that criticism that others make, you know, that uh, um, whether it's the leader of opposition, S.P. Mukherjee, or the president, Rajinder Prasad, many of them feel, A, that the amendment is unjustified. But even if it were to be justified, the process that is being undertaken, right? So you're doing it, even though technically it's correct, uh, the amendment is being passed by a provisional parliament without an election, which only has a single house where the Congress enjoys, um, you know, almost unchallenged dominance and where uh, wide swaths of public opinion, um, whether it's from the press or whether it's from the bar associations, um, whether it's from the chambers of commerce and industry, whether it's from landed interests, uh, uh, 
do not think that there is any imminent need um, for this. So uh, he, it's it's a very fine line that he treads. So he's he is he does have a slightly overbearing and authoritarian temperament. He acknowledges that himself. Uh, he has. Um, he is in the process. So when the story of the of the First Amendment unfolds, he is in the process of acquiring almost unchallenged dominance both over the Congress Party and over government machinery. Um, so, in a sense, this amendment also represents that process. It represents a power grab that is going to rest greater authority with him um, uh, than had previously been, you know, envisaged, and so. He has those tendencies, and he's 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 very forthright uh, about it. But along with that, he's very conscious that he wants things to appear to go through, uh, or at least to go through that process. Now, that process gives him what he wants. So there's a question of does that mean he's a Democrat, or does it not? Now, it can be read as both ways, right? Democracy gave Nehru what he wanted, so there was never any reason to push the constitutional envelope, you know, beyond a point. Uh, but it could be read both ways. So, yes, he was he had an authoritarian tendency, but also he was careful to keep the... One might say he was keeping an illusion. One might say, actually, he was really committed to uh, the democratic uh, process. Both yeah. readings would be yeah. fine. A large portion of your book uh, is dedicated to Zamindari Abolition Act yeah. and debates around it yeah. the, because it was a big issue. And somewhere, uh, as you have uh, earlier pointed out also, that Nehru made it a point that we have promised people for yes. Zamindari Abolition. Yes. And he made it a point. Then you show in your book, uh, yes. in your thesis, you show that Actually, it wasn't the case because yes. uh, it wasn't the case because yes. court ruled in favor of Nehru at b- that point of time, yes. at least. Yes. So somewhere it was. Uh, then why uh, uh, the another point is which is more important for me right now? If uh, we say that uh, Nehru, uh, Sardar Patel, yes, Ambedkar, etc., everybody felt that look, there is some flaw in our constitution which was drafted. Uh, 16 months back uh, yeah. almost and they started feeling it within two or three months yeah they started feeling it so do we want to say that those people who drafted our constitution didn't actually understand the constitutionality the legal the legality and other aspects of it no they did i mean there was a i i wouldn't go that far there was uh, you know there was a lot of discussion and a lot of work that went into drafting the constitution uh, I guess, I mean, ultimately the constitution is going to be interpreted by multiple stakeholders, by the government, by the legislature, uh, and even more importantly, by the judiciary. So obviously they could not anticipate how things would be uh, you know, interpreted by the judiciary. But as far as Zamindari abolition goes, they were very careful in drafting the constitution because they were aware that these questions would come up. And that was the reason why, you know, uh, the much of the terminology used, for example, the absence of due process. Uh, so the terminology used is, um, uh, you know, as determined by law rather than the due process of the law, for example. And uh, in that they were right, because when Zamindari Abolition Acts came up uh, in front of the judiciary, the vast majority were found to be un, uh, to be constitutional. The only one that was found to be unconstitutional was Bihar, and that was again not the right to property; uh, it was the right to Dis- equality. equality. So they were aware. Uh, it's not as they were not aware, which is what begs the question: why they thought they had to amend the constitution, and that's what the book um, the book is about. Because there is a strand of scholarly opinion which argues that actually. Uh, the constitution already, you know, privileged the state, privileged uh, community groups, uh, and privileged the kind of socialistic revolution over the question of individual rights. But that's, if you look at, read the first chapter of 16 Stormy Days, you'll see that that is not how they present it to the public. They present it to the public as a charter of freedom. No one goes out and says, well, you know, we found this great way to have a socialist revolution. And here's the uh, here's the revolutionary document. Uh, they present it as a charter of freedom because that's how it's being sold and that's how it's being seen. I think it is still being sold by that name. 
Yes. You, when you yes. look at the popular, uh, you know, yes. notion among masses or in politics, we say that look, Constitution of India is something very revolutionary document. Yes. <laughs> we talk so, about it. No, but that is what was revolutionary about it, right? So the revolutionary bit was the uh, was part three was individual rights. Uh, because that was what was considered to be the dividing line between the colonial period and the post-colonial period. Because if you replaced one authoritarian government with another authoritarian government, what were you changing? Ultimately, the change that came uh, was in the process, was the democratic process and um, civil liberties. And so it's interesting to see how they came to this conclusion. And that's what I try to delineate uh, in the book, because they were very aware that these questions... Uh, would come up. So, um, I mean, one could take the position and say, well, no, they were not aware. They didn't know what they were talking about. But I don't think that's true. I think they did know what they were talking about. The book about. talks about the debates, uh, the, uh, you know, around the First Amendment. And you tell us about that, uh, uh, you have written about it, that left, right, everybody was threatened with this. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the amendment was there to control both left and right as well as uh, you know you can say civil societies etc yes. and they joined hands yes. against nehru at yes. that point of time uh, it's uh, don't you look that it is like a continuity which happened later during emergency days with indira gandhi or during vp singh days with rajiv gandhi that everybody joined hands against uh, the same family or the same dynasty as they say in uh, popular yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought of it in those terms, but now that you mention it, yes, there is. And I think there was uh, um, a strand of anti-Congressism that, unite, that united various strand, uh, you know, various um, other ideological positions uh, in Indian politics. Partly, I think it was, uh, you know, it's what you would expect, right? If you want to unseat a dominant, if there is one dominant figure or one dominant pole, uh, then the others um, in opposition them. automatically, uh, because it was already weak and divided, uh, needed a kind of, uh, you know, they need they needed support from each other. Uh, but th- I guess there is a there is that continuity, and there is that you see uh, that continuity not just in the way they unite against uh, Nehru or Indira Gandhi or later. Uh, against Rajiv Gandhi in the VP Singh experiment. But you see it also, I think, in thought process and other things because um, there have been, uh, in workers' movements, for example, the uh, trade unions and workers' movements from both sides of the spectrum have collaborated in uh, uh, in multiple efforts. And uh, in thought process and ideological positions as well, if you think of something as uh, you know, fundamental as um, as workers' rights, or um, think of something such as economics. There had been a large degree of overlap between the communist left uh, and the sort of BJS BJP right um, during the time period of uh, you know, look at an uh, an economic the prime the prime economic thinker for the RSS BJP was. A gentleman named Datupat Thengri, and if you look at the writings of Datupat Thengri, you'll uh, they're not that far off, you know, from uh, uh, from full fledged socialism in a way. So um, there was there was more than just an opportunist opportunistic, I'd say, there was more uh, alliance. There was uh, there was something to link them together, yeah. and it's interesting that we see it come together mm-hmm. first. Uh, in, Your in book is story. about Sir Nehru, of yes. course, it is. But uh, there is another person who is like uh, another very important person who is still talked in India a lot, Mr. Ambedkar. Yes. You have talked about him. Yes. And you have actually talked about him that how he drafted a constitution and then he drafted its first amendment. And then after... Um, some time uh, when he resigned, after he resigned, he again took up case for zamindars, <laughs> yes. and you know he took uh, he took a position. Then he went back. Then he again came in front. So how do you see his position within the you know within this debate? How do you position him? What was this? 
So I think Ambedkar was, the impression that I get is that Ambedkar was not entirely in agreement uh, with Nehru. And if you were to read later Ambedkar's you know, speech on his resignation and stuff, he, he already says that by this point, uh, he was quite isolated in the Nehru cabinet, not consulted on many important matters, uh, a kind of quite lonely sort of political figure. Now, Ambedkar's position uh, given that, as you mentioned, he argued for the zamindars um, in in a case, and before where, that for the amendment, for the amendment, and the arguments that he presents uh, in that case are actually the opposite of what he argues in the in in parliament. Uh, I mean that I could only put down to the ex exigencies of practical politics. You know, once he when he's in government, he has to take the government side. Once he leaves it, uh, he's happy to take a legal brief, which would um, have him argue against his own position, uh, which he had taken when he was in government. But actually, not just does he do it, Ambedkar comes to a point in life where he also repudiates his own constitution, where he says, you know, I was a hack, and so on and so forth. So um, Ambedkar's, the arc of Ambedkar's thought is actually quite, quite interesting. But Ambedkar, like Nehru, was I think was thinking about sovereignty. He was someone who believed in state power and in the state directing Indian society because he, again, didn't think Indian society had the capacity for uh, capacity to change or to reform. So it was going to be done in a top-down manner with uh, you know they all believed someone in the authority of parliament. Yeah, someone someone wielding a stick from the from the top uh, when it came to come to you know when it comes to the question of caste and so on. And if you want to wave a stick from the top, then you have to have, you know, um, have to have all of these powers, otherwise you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Triple Daman Singh Ji. Uh, thanks for your time. And for my, uh, our viewers, uh, this is a book which the people who are interested in Nehru and want to look into different aspects of his life, his politics, and the evolution of Indian state, especially the post-colonial state, should read. And I must say that I have read it in a sitting. Uh, I started it and I completed it. And it's really captivating and you should read it. Buy it from Amazon. Uh, it's on Amazon, I think. It is yeah, available, yes. It is on Amazon. So it is a good book. And thank you, Tripurdaman Singh, for coming to our Thank studio. you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.